Awesome. God bless everyone this morning. How's everyone doing today? So I'm super excited to be here, um, super humbled to be here. Thank you so much, Pastor Joe, for trusting me uh, to bring a word to this congregation. Um, a little bit about me uh, real quick before I do anything is um, I am not from Arizona. I'm from Philadelphia. Uh, I was born and raised there um, in the playground. I spent most of my days. Um, I will not be rapping that song. Uh, but uh, no, I was born in Philadelphia and um, felt God's call probably around 2016 to come to Arizona because he had to work for me here. And, you know, we, me and my family prayed and we stepped out in faith and God has brought us here. And just, we've been just doing amazing, amazing things here uh, from pastoring a small church to just ministering to people to helping leaders grow to helping small businesses. God has been doing a lot. So I'm excited for the work that he's doing. Um, and so I wanted to, before I get started on my sermon, I uh, want to uh, pray first. And I wanted to share a song that I wrote. I'm not going to do the whole beat and performing thing. I'm going to do more of a acapella, uh, sort of a spoken word, because uh, I really want you to be ministered rather than entertained. And so um, I want to make sure that, you know, you be ministered to. So let's just get into some prayer. So Heavenly Father, we just come before you just thanking you, Father. This is your time, not mine. This is your church. Let your will be done. Holy Spirit, let your voice be louder than mine. We surrender this time to you. Let your will be done in Jesus' name. Amen. So this song I'm going to share with you is actually called I Surrender All. And it came from a place of really understanding what surrender was. Um, the type of music that I do, I'm a rapper, but I do more of a worship thing. I, I love to worship. I have a heart to worship. I was just never blessed with the vocal cords to worship. But I knew how to write and I knew how to rap. And so I felt like, let me combine my heart for worship with the art and the talent that God has given me. And so a lot of it is worship centered, but this next song is called I Surrender All. And it just comes from the place of really understanding what surrender was and what that looked like in my life because I, I, I thought was, oh, I got to surrender my time and come to church or I got to surrender my meal and fast, you know, once a week. And there was so much more to it than that. And so um, here it goes. It goes, let me start with the attitude, the first to go. Please eliminate my pride and the cocky flow. I surrender all my ways. Let me stop. You go. In this maze called life, this is not a show. I'm not a star. I'm grounded. The sky is far from me. A simple dude with a lot of scars. Once driven by insecurities, doubt, and fears. But I give it all up, God, without a tear. I'm done crying over things that I need to let go. So let's go. I'm trying to move fast like techno. I got to loosen my grip so your voice won't echo. Repeating what you're saying like your words ain't special. You deserve reaction after command. So I react with obedience as I'm after your hands. I must always remember you're the master of man. And surrendering my all is the master of plans. So I surrender all. All of me, all my hopes and dreams. Everything that's just close to me. I surrender all. All my days, all my nights to come every breath that I take to my life is done all of me all my hopes and dreams everything that's just close to me I surrender all all my days all my nights to come every breath that I take to my life is done I can't live the way I want to live because if I live then I can't give what I want to give you and that's my life it's all yours without asking twice I give up my dark ways but I ask for light but help me my imaginary crown is stuck humble me even if I eat the ground for lunch like Nebuchadnezzar it's better if I never let pride put a vest on me it brings stress on me I surrender all my thoughts and habits if it means more of you then you ought to grab it please understand that it's not a demand but a request a less of me as I follow your plans my life my eyesight and my wife is yours the mic the limelight and the vocal cords I'm all yours Lord and I yearn for that passion your sandals I surrender to be worthy to strap them so all of me all my hopes and dreams everything that's just close to me I surrender all all my days all my nights to come every breath that I take to my life Life is done. So all of me, all my hopes and dreams, everything that's just close to me, I surrender all, all my days, all my nights to come. Every breath that I take to my life is done. My knees is bent, white flag is raised. 
Head is bowed, but the other hand, that's up for praise. You deserve more glory, so it's up for days, up for months and years till I make it clear so they can see through me and your face appears. Take away my stone heart and state your grace is here. So here, I surrender all my raw emotions just to stand on holy ground like the call of Moses, set apart and chosen. You provide salvation. Break the ground that I stand on if it's my foundation. It's the rock I stand, the rock I need, the rock I love, the only single rock that bleeds i won't stop oh god to that lots of me turns to all of you like it's got to be i won't stop oh god to that lots of me turns to all of you like it's got to be so i surrender all of me all my hopes and dreams everything that's just close to me i surrender all all my days all my nights to come every breath that i take to my life is done Thank you so, so much. So I'm excited to uh, bring a word to you today that uh, I felt the Lord really speak to me heavy on these past couple of weeks, ever since I was asked to uh, minister here. Um, it's an exciting word because uh, this word, if you grasp onto it, it's going to put you on the side of victory. How many of us want to be on the side of victory? Raise your hand. Right? We want to be on a side of victory and not defeat. And so what I felt the Lord was sharing is that he gave me steps through the story of Rahab that she took to get her victory, to get into a place of victory. And so the title of this sermon is called The Other Side of the Wall. And so I struggled with this message a little bit because of the political stuff that's going on. And I'm not talking about any of that. But I was like, do I call it the other side of the wall? But I'm going to go for it because that's the title the Lord gave me. It's not a political statement. But I want to talk about what it looks like to be on the other side of the wall. What it looks like to be on the right side of the wall. And so I know you'd like to do your discussion question first so we can put that up there. I think it's slide two, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. So here are two questions. You can answer one or the other. You don't have to answer both. But uh, look at the questions. And so the first question is, how do you define faith? And how does it influence the way you navigate challenges and uncertainties in life? Or think about a time uh, when you felt God leading you to step out in faith. How did it feel? And what was the outcome? So I'll give you guys a couple of minutes to discuss those questions. And yeah, get the conversation going. All right, all right. I like to hear conversation going on. It's one of my favorite parts is the, the fellowshipping of the saints. And I'm going to get more into this later, but it's so important to make sure that you're taking the time to share your stories of faith and to hear from other people who have stories of faith. That stirs up our faith. That helps us believe uh, for God to do greater things in our lives. So these moments are so important. Don't ever take them lightly because these are moments to really build your faith. So I really appreciate that Joe does that. And so, yeah, let's, let's get into this. So we're going to jump into uh, Joshua and we're going to uh, read the story of Rahab. So if you can get those scriptures up, it's going to be uh, Joshua chapter 2. And we're going to read it verses 1 through 21. And so it says... Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly spent two, side, uh, two spies from Shittim. Go look over the lamb, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of the prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. The king of Jericho was told, look, some of the Israelites have come, there to, come here tonight to spy on the land. So the king of Jericho sent his message to Rahab. Bring out the men who came to you and entered your house uh, because they have come to spy out the whole land. Where am I? Okay. You, uh, uh, but the woman had taken the two men and hid them. She said, yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they had come from. At dusk, when it was, at dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, they left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You may catch up with them. But she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them under stalks of flax and had laid them out of the roof, on the roof. So the men set out to pursue the spies on the road that leads uh, to uh, fords, uh, for, yeah, fords of the Jordan. And as soon as the, pursuer, uh, as soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut. Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly... Wait, I'm sorry, we already read that. 
and let me go here, because, and then it says, um, before the spies uh, laid down for the night, she went up to the roof and said, um, go, she went up to the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that great fear, uh, and the great fear of you have, have fallen on us so that all who live in the country are meeting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord has dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what, uh, what, and what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard it, our hearts melted in fear, and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven, is the God in heaven and earth above, and uh, God of heaven above and earth below. Now then, please swear to me that the Lord uh, that will give you, uh, that the Lord that you will show me kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign of what, that you will spare the, uh, the lives of my father and my mother and my brothers and sisters and all who belong to them, that you will save us from death. Our lives for your lives, the men assured her. If you do not tell what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us the land. So uh, she left them, she let them down on a rope uh, of the window for the house uh, she lived in was a part of the city wall. She said to them, go into the hills and the pursuers uh, will not find you. Hide yourselves for three days until they return and then go on your way. Now the man had uh, said to her, the oath you made uh, us swear will not be uh, binding on us unless uh, when we enter the land, you have tied the scarlet cord to this window through which you let us down. And unless you have brought your father and mother and brothers and all of your family into your home, if any of them go outside of your house into the street, their their blood will be on um, their own heads, and you will, and we will not be responsible. As for those who are in the house with you, their blood, uh, as, as those who will be in the house with you, their blood will be on our head if, uh, and our, if our hand is laid on them. If you tell who we are or what we are doing, we will uh, be released from this oath you made us swear. Agreed, they, she replied. Let it be as you say. So she sent them on her way, and, depart, and they departed as she, try, as she tied the scarlet cord uh, to the window. And so as we go through the scriptures, a lot going on. Just to sum it up real quick, the spies had come because God was doing something big. They had just got, they had been delivered from Egypt. They have been get, they have gotten set free. Joshua is now the leader. Moses has transitioned on. And now they're taking territory. God is using them to conquer territory, to, to occupy land. They went from slaves um, in a territory to becoming territory owners. And the next on that list was certain parts of land and specifically Jericho. And so Joshua sends out these two spies to go spy out the land of Jericho so that they can go and conquer according to what God has called them to do. And so in the midst of this, they meet this prostitute named Rahab. They stay at her house. She knows that God is doing something in their lives. She clearly sees that God was doing something in their lives. And so she wanted to be a part of what God was doing in their lives. So she had a narrative that she, 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 had, a, she had to choose a narrative. So the narrative to the people of Jericho was that place was going to fall and they were going to be conquered. But she heard another narrative that God was doing something in other people's lives. And she wanted to attach herself to the narrative where God wanted to move where God was doing something, where God was setting people free, where God was turning slaves into victors, where God was displaying his power. She wanted to become a part of that narrative. And so she takes four steps, say four steps. She takes four steps to change the direction, to get on the other side of that wall, to change the narrative that, that, that was facing her and the land of Jericho, okay? And so we're going to go through every one of those steps. And so the first step that she took, if you put that up there, is she invited God into her hidden place, 
places or her hidden spaces. You see, when she invited the spies to stay with her, that was symbolic of allowing what God was doing into her personal space. They went into her home. This is the private spaces, the spaces not everyone sees. This is the spaces that, that's very private. No one goes into this room. No one goes into that room. This is a very private place, but she lets these spies stay there with her. He didn't, they didn't just show up and she's like, I know who you are. I know what you're doing. Get out. She actually invites them in and she hides them in her personal spaces. And so in order to, to start your way to getting on the right side of the wall or the other side of the wall, you have to be open to allow your pers God into your personal spaces. You got to let God be into the, the depths of your heart. God is so wanting to, he's a father that wants to be involved in every aspect of your life. And sometimes, and I make this mistake growing up, and God has dealt with me on this mistake. Sometimes I compartmentalize God. God was in certain compartments, and he, was in, he, he wasn't in others. And so, yeah, I allow God into my church attendance, and I allow God into my tithing, but I didn't allow him into my finances. Right? Oh, God, you, you can have the 10%, but I'm not going to let you tell me how to spend my money. You know, oh, God, you can, you, can have, you can have my relationship with my pastors and my elders, but I'm not going to invite you into how I relate to my spouse or how I relate to my boss and how I relate to my coworkers and how I relate to my enemies. God, you can have access to these areas in my life, but I'm not letting you into those personal areas in my life. And so the truth is, in order for you to get on that side of victory when things are crumbling down, the first thing you got to do is say, God, I allow you to have full access, full access. You have to get into, get into every crescent of my heart, every nook and cranny. I want you in everywhere. And so, you know, when I, when I realized that I was compartmentalizing God, I had to pray for repentance. And then God was showing me scriptures that really just came to life for me. And so one of those scriptures is actually Proverbs. You can write this down. I don't have the slide for it, but you can write this down. Proverbs 3, and it says, um, five, verses 5 and 6, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths in all of your ways. Trust him with all of your heart. This is a dad who wants to be involved, right? We, we look at God as this, this, fear, this thing that we should, this person that we should fear and that we should like, oh my God, stay away, God. No, God says, yeah, you should fear me, but that fear is reverence, but I want access, full access. I want full access. And so, that has led me to pray, in my opinion, one of the most powerful Psalms, and it's in Psalms 139, I mean 139, 23, and 24, and this is something that I pray, and it's, it's, it can get ugly, but it's worth it. It says, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me. And lead me into the way of everlasting. I challenge you to pray that. Lord, search the depths of my heart. Expose my anxious thoughts. Expose my anger. Expose my guilt. Expose my shame. Expose my insecurities. Expose those things. Because if you expose them, I can repent. And then the good news is, again, we were singing about a good God. We were singing about a deliverer. We were singing about a God who sets me free. The cool thing is... He exposes them to you, not to bring you down, but to get you free. He exposes those things, and he says, I'm exposing those because I want you set free. I want access because I'm the healer. I'm your salvation, and I want access to those things. So let me bring those things to light, not to shame you, not to guilt you, but to set you free. Who the Son sets free is free indeed. We are called to be a free people. God had took the Israelites out of slave because slavery wasn't meant for them. Slavery doesn't fit well and so God wants us free but the only way we can be truly free is we give him total access Mark 12 30 says what love the Lord your God with all of your heart with all of your soul with all of your mind and with all of your strength see heart in biblical terms 
is often considered the center of a person's emotions, desires, and motivation. Loving God with all your heart means having genuine and wholehearted affection for him. For the soul, the soul represents the innermost spiritual part of a person. Loving God with all of your soul involves a deep spiritual connection and dedication to him. See, the mind refers to the intellect, the thoughts, and the understanding. Loving God with all of your mind means engaging in worship and devotion with, clear and fo- with a clear and focused mindset, seeking to understand and know him more deeply. Your strength, loving God with all of your strength, typically relates to the physical energy and, abil- and abilities. Loving God with all of your strength involves putting effort and energy into serving him and obeying him and using your physical resources to honor him. Do you see how God wants to be involved in every aspect of our lives? I was just talking about this in a small group. How many of you ever seen the movie Goofy Movie from Disney? Raise your hand if you've seen that. I love that movie as a kid and I love it as an adult. See, as a kid, I can relate to Max like, oh, this is just an annoying father who's just pestering him. And just, I'm like, Goofy, just leave him alone. He likes this girl. Let him do him. Let him, let him be him. Let him grow up. Give him his space. Give him his boundaries. And so as a kid, I can relate to Max. But as an adult, I can relate to Goofy as a dad who just wants to be involved in his son's life. And they go through this argument back and forth in the movie. And I remember this. And, and, and Max screams out, Dad, I have my own life. And Goofy goes, son, I know. I just want to be a part of it. And as a dad with two boys and they're growing up, they love me to death. They give me hugs and kisses. I I love it. I love it. I love it. I know they're watching. Hi, Kalel. Hi, Lucas. Um, They're homesick, and so pray for them. But um, they love me to death. But I know when those teenage years hit, things might change. And I know they're going to want their own life. But I'm going to be a dad who wants to be a part of their life because I love them. So me, an earthly father with flaws in all, going to have this yearning to be a part of my kid's life, how much more a heavenly father. So what areas in your life does God not have access to? Is it the day-to-day stuff or is it at the heart and soul level? I can tell you the safest person to trust with those deep places and those hidden places is God. So I have my keys here, right? The keys represent access, right? What doors are you going to unlock? Say, God, you're invited into this space. Rahab was a prostitute. Can you imagine the shame of that space? Can you imagine the shame of that space? Can you imagine the guilt and the, 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 the feeling of unworthy to let men of, she knew these were men of God. Like she didn't have no clue who they were. She clearly knew who they were. She clearly knew who was backing them, but she let them into a space of a prostitute. She let them into that space of shame, of guilt. She trusted God with that space. How much more can you trust God with that space? Let's go to the second thing she did. So the second thing that she did was she took, she she embraced an authority switch. So I want to go through the scripture very quickly. So the king of Jericho sent the message to Rahab. Bring out the men who came to you, who entered your house, because they have come to spy out the land. And the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. She said, yes, the man came, but I did not know where they had come from. Uh, At dusk, when it was time to close the gate, they left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You may catch up with them. But she had taken them up on the roof and hid them under some stalks uh, of flax and had out um, that she had laid out on the roof. So the men uh, set out in pursuit of the spies. Um, and the road that leads to the fords of the Jordan. And as soon as the pursuit, the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut. This 
really struck me because what I saw Rahab do when she had lied to the king or lied to the king's messengers, which was pretty much the same, she broke ties with the thing that had authority over her life. She broke ties with the person who had authority because if the king would have found out she lied, she could have been put to death. So at some point, she had made this conscious decision to say, this can't be my authority anymore. This can't dictate my lifestyle anymore. This can't make my decisions anymore. This person, this way of life is no longer making my decisions. I am doing something personally to say, I'm ending this relationship. This has no authority over me because I'm choosing the authority of God. I'm choosing the authority of God. So Rahab had to make that switch to say, I'm no longer under this authority. I'm making it very clear that I'm putting my life at risk to, to say, I'm done with this authority because I want to be under God's authority. Because I, she said it, I saw that God had dried up the waters for you. I saw that God had delivered you from Egypt. I saw that you, this came down and this city came down and these walls come down. I seen what God is doing and I don't just want to see anymore. I want to be a part of it. But I know the only way for me to be a part of what God is doing is to say, God, I surrender to you and allow you to be my king. At some point, sorry, my ADD. <laughs> At some point, we have to learn. I mean, Jesus is always going to be our Savior. But we have to learn to make a decision for him to be our Lord. Yeah, I, I can preach about a God who saves me. And yes, Jesus does save. And Jesus does deliver. And Jesus does heal. And those are great things about him. But we have to make a conscious decision to say, I'm going to let you be my Lord. What you say goes. And so, again, like, Pray that prayer of Psalms, search my heart. Because again, like if, if, if you've been in this world, I'm sure God will expose some things that you may have authority to uh, have authority over you. And, and if you're wondering if does anything have authority over me, do, is God Lord of my life? Well, let me, let me teach you something. And, and this, is, this is deep and this convicted me too. I'm not exempt from this. This is what I felt the Holy Spirit say about authority. Anything you have to consult with to do the will of the Father has authority over you. Anything that you have to consult with to do the will of the Father has authority over you. That authority could be fear. That authority could be shame. That authority could be guilt. That authority could be a sin. That authority could be fleshly desires. That authority can be traditions. That authority could be religion. That authority could be ministry. I, I'm going to be very transparent with you. Daily, fear tries to plague my life. Daily, fear tries to come into my life and, 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 and force me to make decisions for fear, and, I, and there are times where I said, fear wins, God, you have to be put on hold. I'm too afraid to do this, God. I'm too afraid to step out. I'm too afraid to act in faith. And every time I've done that, I've made fear my Lord, and I made Jesus my Savior. And, and let me teach you something um, when it comes to that, because this is so important and this is something that really messed with my heart. I've learned that when you choose God as first resort, when God is your first resort, you get to walk in his favor. But when you choose him as last resort, then you experience his mercy. When you choose God as first resort, you walk in his favor. But when you choose him as last resort, you get to experience his mercy. And when I chose him as last resort, it's because something had authority over my life. Yeah. Jesus has said something remarkable. 
he said something remarkable that just messed with me. Right? And it's in Matthew 6, 24. And this is the, the story of the rich young ruler. We know the story. Rich young ruler comes. He's a man of status. Um, people believe that he was a leader in a church, whatever the case may be. Interestingly, and I'm, don't quote me that saying this is 100% sound doctrine, but there are some people that believe that this rich young ruler could have been Paul. Um, and they have, like, cool things to back it up. But, again, don't quote me on that. It's just a fun theory. Um, but the, 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 the story goes, this rich young ruler comes and he says, you know, Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Um, and Jesus gives him a list and he goes, cool, I've been doing all those things. You know, he thinks he's good and he thinks he's, he's in the in crowd. He's like, I'm in, I'm in. And he says, but there's still one thing I want you to do. And then he goes, you know, I want you to sell all your belongings and not only keep the money, but I want you to take that money and give it to the poor. Of course, we know the story. He walks away sad because he was a man of great possessions. But Jesus had said something that blew my mind in this. And he goes um, in uh, 20, chapter, verse 24, he says, no one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. Right? In this case, money was the context but Jesus was talking about something much deeper than that, right? We all read the story. We all like the verse that says, for with God, nothing is impossible. But Jesus says, hey, there's one thing that's impossible and that no one is exempt from. And that one thing that's impossible is that you can't have two masters. You can't have two things have authority over you. You can't. It's impossible. You are not exempt from that because at some point you're going to have to make a decision, just like the rich young ruler. At some point, if you're following God and you're in this for the long run, you're going to have to hit a fork in the road. And you're going to have to choose. Because it is impossible for you to have two masters. Jesus said it. And so day after day after day. I have to say authority. I have to say fear. You have no authority over me. And I brought this illustration because this is what I have to do daily. I don't want that mic to fall. This says king and it has a fear and it has a crown over it, representing the authority that he has. If you want to be on the other side of that wall, if you want to be in a place of victory, you have to make the decision to say, you have no authority over me. Shame, you have no authority over me. Fear, you have no authority over me. Guilt, you have no authority over me. Because I'm allowing the Lord to be my king. I'm allowing the Lord to be my savior. And the good news is this, when you choose to make God your authority, when you choose to make God your king, you're getting a king who gives you a hope and a future. You're getting a king who is anointed to bring the good news to the poor, to heal the blind and set the captives free. You're getting a king who is rich in mercy. You're getting a king whose mercy endures forever. You're getting a king whose blood sets you free. You're getting a king who provided a substitute because we couldn't live up to the standards who provided a substitute because he loved us to be the sacrificial lamb so that we can be in good standing with him so when I say that you have to let go of those old authorities they can be scary because we have had them most of our lives and what I'm saying is that if you choose to trust God that's the type of king that you're getting but we have to make that decision to say enough is enough Rahab made that decision The third thing that Rahab did was she went beyond herself. So that's point three. Rahab had went beyond herself. And so just to save you time, because I know I don't want to be long-winded here. I'm not going to read it. But the two things that stood out to me in this portion of Scripture is that Rahab um, 
when she went and, and interacted with the spies, she gives this whole speech. I know God is with you. I know God is doing things. I know God is, has been delivering you. I know God has given you this land. I know God has, from the heaven above and the earth below is granting you these things. I know you got a testimony. I know you got some things that God is doing in your life. And so what she was doing at that moment was she was going beyond herself and she invited herself to, 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 to celebrate other people's testimonies. She invited herself to get with some community who had testimony. She invited herself to say, this isn't just about me. I want to get myself around people and some folk that God is doing something with. It's so easy to isolate ourselves. It's so easy to say, you know what? I'm just going to go to church. I'm going to just do me. And, you know, God is doing stuff with them, but I'm going to just do me. But there's so much importance to community. There's so much importance to getting around the right community, not only just hanging out with people, but getting uh, strategically around people who got some faith stories, getting strategically around some people that God is actively doing something in their lives, especially if you're struggling with your faith, especially if you're struggling this, is God going to pull through for me? Is God going to make a way for me? Because I see walls crumbling all around me. I see the inevitable happening. I'm, I'm struggling with this idea that God is doing something. Get around some folk who have some stories. Ask questions. Get around some folk. Let them stir up your faith, right? What does faith come by? Does faith come by your knowledge of the word of God? Faith comes by hearing. Why do you think God gave us two ears and one mouth? <laughs> two ears. Right? We got to get around some folks who have a story. We got to get around and we got to celebrate that. I, I'm going to be honest. I, I struggled with that for so many years. I, 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 there were certain breakthroughs that I wanted personally that I didn't see God do. And then when I would hear other stories, my ears would automatically close because I would be like, why does God do it for them and not for me? I don't want to hear their story. I don't want to hear how good they're doing. I don't want to hear testimonies because it just reminds me of the disappointment that God isn't doing something for me. And that was the enemy lying to me. That was the enemy telling me, hey, close your ears. God, what God was doing in those moments was trying to stir up my faith. What God was doing in that moment was trying to, to give me hope, right? And, and, and I asked the question about, well, you know, about faith and what do you think faith is? What do you think, you know, and all that stuff. And so something that I think that was so cool that the Lord had showed me was um, faith believes God can do God can do something, but what hope does, it says, hope says that he can do it for me. So faith believes that God can do many things, but hope says that God can do it for me. And so we got to get around some folk to testify, that testify about the goodness of God. And we got to be open to going beyond ourselves and celebrate with them. Hey, because guess what? We are one body. So if one person is victorious, we are all victorious. If one person get a breakthrough, we all can share in that breakthrough. Again, she had to, Rahab had to just change the narrative a little bit and say, oh, my walls are coming now. She's like, no, I want to be a part of what God is doing in you. I know that it's inevitable that God is going to tear this place down. I know it's inevitable that things are going to crumble around me. I know it's inevitable that this place is going to fall, but I know your story, and I know that God is doing something in you. I want to become a part of that. The second part of this thing is that she didn't only contend for herself. She said, hey, you know, I know God is doing something, and I want my own breakthrough, but I want other people to have that breakthrough too. So not only save me, can you save my brother? Can you save my father? Can you save my sisters? It's about going beyond ourselves, realizing that the breakthrough is not just for you, that that breakthrough is for your neighbor. Push your neighbor and say, the breakthrough is for you too. Go ahead, go ahead. Get some movement going on. The breakthrough is for you too. Come on. That's right. That's right. Get some movement going on. Because that's the truth. It's never about just us. 
It's never about just, the Bible's full of verses about encouraging one another. The Bible's full of verses about praying for one another. The Bible's full of verses about speaking life into one another. And so sometimes we have to go beyond ourselves. We have to go beyond what, what you know, oh, I want this breakthrough. I need this in my life to say, you know what? I'm inviting other people. God, I know I need a breakthrough, but my sister needs a breakthrough too. I know that I'm going through something, but my brother's going through something too. And so God, the way that I'm praying for me and how I'm contending for me and how I'm interceding for me, I'm going to intercede for my brother. I'm going to intercede for my sister. I'm going to pray for them to get the salvation. I'm going to speak deliverance into them because it's not just about us. The most dangerous object to a believer is a mirror, and it needs to be shattered. So we need to go beyond ourselves. We need to go beyond ourselves. She was stirred up. Her faith, the story in others, the testimony of others stirred her up. And it didn't stir her up for just her. It stirred her up for her and her family and those that were closest to us. Right? James 5, 16, therefore confess your sins to each other. Pray for each other so that you may be healed. Look at that. Pray for each other so that you may be healed. Sometimes our breakthrough, what's stopping our breakthrough is our, 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 limit, our, our, limits, our limitations for not praying for one another. You know that when, if you read the story of Job, it says that when, when Job prayed for his friends, then he got his breakthrough. You read the story of Job. Ephesians 6, 18 says this, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayer and requests with this in mind. Be alert and always keep praying for all the Lord's people, all the Lord's people. When Jesus teaches us how to pray, what's the name of that prayer? Our, ah, who said it? Our. He says, I'm going to teach you how to pray. The first word he teaches is Our. Not my, our father. He's teaching them that this is beyond us. And so Rahab, her second step was, uh, her third step saying, I need to go beyond myself. Now the fourth step, the most important, important step. She started with Jesus. Now the man had said to her, this oath you made us swear it will not be uh, uh, swear us the oath that you made us swear will not be binding on us unless when we enter the land you have tied the scarlet cord in the window through through which you let us down and unless you have brought your family and and mother and your brother and all your family into your house if any of them go outside of your house or into the street, uh, their blood will be on their own heads, uh, but, um, and we will not be responsible. As for those who are in your house, their blood will be on, your, uh, on our head if our hand is laid on them. But if you tell uh, what we're doing, and we will be released from our oath um, and that you made us swear. Agreed, she replied. Let it be as you say. She sent them away quickly quickly and they departed and then she tied the scarlet cord in the window the scarlet cord red that was that was symbolic of the blood of Jesus right you go to exodus and they had to put the lamb's blood on the doorstep she wasn't there but she caught something in her spirit that says this, I, I have to do a prophetic act I have to do something that says this starts with the blood this starts with the blood. This is so important. The blood of Jesus is so important. And, and, and what I love about this portion of scripture is that she put the, star, the scarlet scarf or the scarlet rope through her window immediately. This was a couple days journey. As a matter of fact, it's a four chapter journey because they don't come back to Jericho until chapter six. So this is a four chapter journey. Not only that the spies had to leave, they had to wait a three days and then they had to go to Joshua. They had to report back and then the army comes. So this was a couple days, maybe a couple weeks, maybe a couple months. But immediately she tied the rope around. Uh, she tied or she hung the rope around the the. Uh, out her window on the city wall she tied it immediately and that shows that the first thing 
And what, what's going to tie all this together is saying Jesus is first. Jesus comes first. The blood and the sacrifice comes first. Without the blood, without the sacrifice of Jesus, without uh, prioritizing Jesus, I just gave you a checklist of religious things to do. And I'm not interested in getting you checklists. I'm interested to seeing you free. I'm interested in seeing you get breakthrough. I'm interested in seeing you healed. I'm interested in seeing you delivered. But none of that takes place until we get to a place that says, Jesus, I need you. I need you, Jesus. Jesus, you are the thing that holds this together. You are the thing that is the, you are the author and finisher of my breakthrough of my life. It is about you and nothing else. I need Jesus in this. I'm not giving you four steps for a healthy life. I'm not giving you a religious list to do. I'm telling you that if you want to be a success, if you want, if you want to, if you want to be successful in this walk, it's not about only your actions, but it's about saying, I trust in you, Jesus. I'm starting with you, Jesus. I have to go back to that foundational place and recognize John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. For those of us who've been in the faith for such a long time, we can kind of get on autopilot and we can kind of just go through the motions and we can do the services and we can do the, the, the church stuff and we can do the missions and ministry stuff and we can tend to forget where it all started. We can tend to forget the source of why we're able to do those things and it is in the blood of Jesus see that scarlet rope represented for Rahab her protection and covering right they said it they said if 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 we don't see that rope um then it's done you're 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 dead they said if no one is in that, whoever's in that house is going to be saved. But if you're not in that house, you're not. So it was a, a source of protection and covering. Co covering. That, that red scarlet a rope was also a symbol of covenant and promise. It was also a symbol of faith and obedience. That sounds a lot like the blood of Jesus. Protection, covering, covenant, promise, faith, obedience. See, Ephesians 1, 7 says this. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in according with the riches and of God's grace. Romans 5, 9 says this. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more, uh, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Colossians 1, 20 says this. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Hebrew 9.14 says this, How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse your consciousness from the acts that lead to death so that we may serve a living God. John 1, 7 says this, but we walk in light as he is in light. We have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from our sins. Again, I can preach all day about breakthrough, effective power, evangelism. However, it becomes all a religious checklist if we're not getting ourselves back to the basics, back to the foundations, to say, Jesus, I need you. And so I want to invite the worship team up. And I want us to get back to that old hymn. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood, Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Come on, sing it like you mean it. This is the declaration that you're making. 
This is a declaration that you're making. This is saying, I need the blood of Jesus. I need Jesus. It is through Jesus that I can do this. This isn't just singing a song. This isn't just participation. This is a moment saying, I'm repenting. I want to put myself on the right side of the wall. It's saying, I want the blood of Jesus because the blood of Jesus sets me free. Keep going, keep going, keep going. What can wash away my sins? What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh. Just keep playing, keep playing. I, I have one last thing I want to say. Oh, Amen. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. As I was prepping for this message, I heard the Lord say, preach this because I'm tearing walls down. Walls are coming down walls are coming down and I want you to show my people hmm, how to be on the right side how to be on the right side of the wall or how to get on the other side of the wall and I know there's some people here that God is tearing things down and I don't know what that looks like but I know God is tearing things down and you may feel like you're in a season of defeat that you're in a season where things are just crumbling it's God moving in the midst but he's saying you need to make the right decisions to get on the right side of the wall you're not meant to crumble with the wall I'm crumbling that wall because I want access to your life so with every eye closed and with every head bowed, and you can turn off the lights if you want. I don't know how you do it here, but this is a moment with you and God. I want to first make an invitation to the most important decision that you can ever make. And it is a decision to say, God, I want you to be my Savior, and I want you to be my Lord. And if you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Savior and Lord, if you're watching today and you don't know Jesus as Savior and Lord, I guarantee you it'll be the best decision that you make in your life. And so if that's you today with every head bowed and eyes closed, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior and you want to get to know him as your Savior and Lord, raise your hand. If you're online and you're watching this live and you've raised your hand, just repeat this prayer in your heart. It doesn't have to be verbatim, but just say, Jesus, I acknowledge that you died for me. I acknowledge your resurrection and I acknowledge your lordship. I am a sinner. Please forgive me for my sins. Wash me of my sins. Be, live, in to, live in my heart and become the Lord of my life. Now I ask for your spirit to fill me, to sanctify me as I walk out this faith walk in Jesus' name. Now the second invitation. Again, I felt God saying clearly, I'm tearing walls down. 
If that's you today, if you feel that walls are crumbling around you and it has been bleak and it looks like defeat and it looks like, I don't know if I can survive this next season. I don't know if I'm built for this next season. My walls are coming down. Things are falling down around me. I'm telling you that God had this word specifically for you. If that's you, I just want you to raise your hand. I just want you to raise your hand. You guys can sing. Now, I'm not going to ask you to come up here because I know that's a private moment. But right now, I just pray in Jesus' name that that, that person or the people who've heard from you, God, who says my walls have been crumbling down and I want to be on the other side of that wall. I pray, Lord, that they will hear your voice clearly, God. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you will give them the faith and strength, Lord, that they need, Father, to, to, to get on the other side of that wall, that they will, f Father, first and foremost, allow you into those spaces, those private spaces, Father, that they will, Father God, cut, a th cut authority with things that hold them back from accomplishing your will. I pray right now in in Jesus name that you will begin to show them folks Lord that they can get around that's going to encourage them that's going to stir up their faith I pray right now in Jesus name that you will remind them that it's not about them that they will begin to intercede and pray for others father and I pray most importantly God that not only them but everyone in here is reminded that this is not possible without you it is only through you that we can make all that all things are possible it is only through you that we can be set free it is only through you that we can get that breakthrough that we need, God. So, Lord, I know you're tearing walls down, but I am encouraged because it's you doing it, God. So thank you, Lord, for this opportunity, Lord. Minister to your people in the way you know how to do best, Lord. And I ask this in Jesus' name.